So glad that you're here. You may have a seat. We're going to be in the book of Matthew once again. We're almost done. I know that you guys are just itching to get out of the book of Matthew. But I hope that over the last 400 years that we've been in the book of Matthew, it's been good, right? It's a lot of good stuff in there, more than hopefully what you thought. Maybe some new stuff has jumped out for you. But it's a, been a good study. But it's not over yet. Remember, Jesus is now in his final days, and he is taking the opportunity to kind of just say what needs to be said. He's not holding back anymore. And there for a moment, the last few weeks, he wasn't speaking in parables, but he's going to share a parable today that I think is applicable to all of us, not just the ones that were hearing him, such as his disciples or anyone else that was around. This parable today is very challenging. Um, it's very eye-opening. It, it, it uh, can put you in a space that might cause you to really look deep within your heart. So if you're not interested in doing that today, you might want to leave. Because it really is a tough passage. He really does look deep. He calls us out and says, hey, take a look. See what really is going on. So before we get any further, let me get you what we're going to talk about today. Here's our main thought for today. Be wise, not foolish. Now, that seems really simple. And it is on purpose because really that's all he's saying. But when he talks about being wise and not foolish, he's not talking about being wise in worldly things. And many of us are very wise in worldly things. Let's just get to it. Like it's just the reality of life. It's who we are. We are wise in things that really we probably should not be wise or maybe we've wasted a lot of time in being wise in. Amen? Three of you. Fantastic. Okay, hopefully you'll get with me toward the end of this sermon. But what we have tried to stress here at Townsend Church is let's not look at the world the way the world wants us to see it. Let's look at the world through spiritual lenses, the way that God intended us to look at it, and let's be wise in that aspect. Therefore, when we're being wise in the spiritual, when we're being wise through what God has for us, when we're using the wisdom that he wants to bless us with when we ask for it, then we will no longer be foolish in the foolish things. That's, that's actually a good thing. Like that's what we're shooting for. That's what we want. You guys got to wake up. Come on. This is important. I know that there's a lot of stuff out in our world that we need to know. I get that. But nothing is as important as knowing Christ. Nothing. There's nothing more important, more uh, needed to know than who Christ is, who I am in him, and really when he's coming back. We've got to be paying attention. And so there are things that we should be wise in and really we should be foolish in. We should be foolish in a lot of the worldly stuff. We just don't know. Not interested. It's going to take up brain space. I was talking to a friend out front, and, and, and sometimes in some of the conversations that I get into, it can be um, very informative. And so I have to pick the things that I can retain and hold on to because I only have a small brain and there's a lot of you. And if you give me all your information all at once, I'm going to forget it. And so I want to be wise in the things that I need to be wise in and foolish in letting some of the stuff that you tell me go. Now, some of y'all are going to be thinking, okay, what is, what is he going to forget when I tell him? Don't play that game, but that's just how my brain has to work. And so there are things in this life that we really need to be wise in. And folks, I'm telling you, I know it's not popular. I know it's not culturally cool. But it's something we need to be very, very knowledgeable in. Very, not even just knowledgeable, but wise in. And it is God. It is Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. It's his word, his living, breathing word. That is what we need to be wise in more than anything else. And listen, we can debate it all day long. Well, I, I need to know about stocks, and I need to know about Bitcoin, and I need to know about the world and TikTok. And maybe. But if you're being wise in those things and not through the filter of what the wisdom of Scripture gives, then you're being foolish. Wisdom comes from God, not from the world. So I become wise by going through the filter of who Christ is and his word and looking at the world through that rather than the other way around. 
because the other way around is absolutely foolish. That's a tough way to start, right? Well, not my words, they're Jesus's, so we'll go see what he has to say. How about that? I'll use him as my scapegoat. In chapter 25, we're literally almost done. We've got chapter 25, and we're done with Matthew. Because we've done the death, the burial, resurrection, we may go to the very end of Matthew with his ascension. That will throw us right into the book of Acts, and we'll get swamped for another six years. (laughs) Amen? It's good stuff, right? Okay, good. Verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So this is a story, it's a parable to help us understand what this looks like. The bridegroom is obviously Christ. He will be coming back to take his church. And so the ten virgins represent here the church. And when it uses virgins, it means the church is pure and it's chaste and it's solely committed to the bridegroom. If a church that you attend is not solely committed to the bridegroom, it is not a church you need to be a part of. It is a foolish church because Christ is the one that our affections should be poured toward more than anything else. And so we find this story, this example of a wedding ceremony of waiting for the bridegroom to come. And you can see the parallels for us because we're waiting for Christ to come. But watch how he tells this story. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Now here's what you have to understand. We don't do that in today's time. So the bridegroom would go off with the bride and they would get married off and there would be a group of friends, a group of people that would stick around to the home that they're coming to and they would wait. Now these celebrations for weddings back in the day could take a week. So moms and dads, I know you complain sometimes when your daughters have this expensive wedding, at least it's not a week long. (laughs) Could you imagine the cost nowadays for a week long wedding? And so this group would wait, and their job was solely to be prepared to go and meet and welcome in the bridegroom and his bride into the home, and they would celebrate again. That was their job. And we see in this parable that it was delayed. Well, they never knew exactly when the bridegroom was coming, but they were at least tasked with waiting And part of their job was to have a lamp ready, lit, to where they could go out and meet them in the dark if necessary and guide them in because obviously there's no street lights back then. And so their job was just to guide them in. And Jesus tells us that there's 10 of these assistants and five of them were super smart, five of them were not. The not so smart ones, they did everything they were supposed to do except prepare beyond what they were tasked to do. They had the lamp. They were there waiting. They understood their responsibility, but they did not think ahead and prepare for the possibility of a delay. Now listen, these people knew what that meant. I guarantee you in all of their culture, in all of their weddings, there was always a delay somehow, some way. So it was a common thing that should have been known. Hey, I need to prepare for a delay. But they fell asleep because the delay happened. That happens, right? We get a little distracted. We get a little off course. We fall asleep. But then they hear the cry. The bridegroom is coming. Now for us, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a trumpet sound. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be awesome. But where will you be and what will you be doing when you hear that sound? Many of us will be slumbering and sleeping. We'll be distracted. We'll be kind of doing our own thing. Many of us. But the response to that cry is what's important. 
All the virgins in verse 7 rose and trimmed their lamps. That has stuck out with me so much. We'll go back to that in just a minute. Trimming the lamps means they cut off the burnt part. They may have trimmed it up or trimmed it down because it was like a cloth wick that was full of oil and would burn for a long time. Trimming it would allow it to burn a little bit cleaner, a little bit brighter. So they were preparing to go forward because it's already been burning. And the foolish ones, oh, by the way, the trimming also means that they refilled the oil. A lot of times it would be a stick with a, a, a wrapping around it that they would light on fire. So they would put it out, re-dip it, cut off all the bad stuff, re-dip it in the oil, and light it again to where it would burn clear. Or it could have been a lamp lamp. Everybody with me on that? But the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Reasonable request, right? We want to be a part of the party. We want to be a part of what we're supposed to do. We forgot to get the oil, so help us out. But the wise answered saying, no, but there should be, uh, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Now it seems like the wise are being cold and um, really just unconcerned with those that didn't have. But the reality is everybody was on the same page they should have known. And the wise were being wise and saying, listen, if I give to you, which I really want to do, but I can't because then I won't have enough for me. It's unshareable oil. I can't give you any more. But here's what I want to encourage you to do because I want you to be a part. Go find it. Go buy it. Go do what you need to do. Now, here's the thing. We have no idea what time this is. We have no idea if it's later in the evening, first thing in the morning, at midnight. Who's going to be up selling oil at midnight? So it could be that they had to wait until the shops opened. They were even more delayed, but that did not delay the bridegroom coming. They didn't know when he was going to get there. They just knew that he was on his way. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, so they're at least making an effort. The bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So they finally get their oil. They come back and they realize we missed it. And they're knocking on the door and look at the response. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the son of man is coming. This is Jesus. Toward the end of his time, he's done all the teaching he's going to do. And this challenge is one of the strongest challenges that I believe Jesus really gave in his time here. He says, you need to pay attention and be ready because you don't know when the bridegroom is coming. So let's pick this passage apart. Let's see what he has for us this morning. So let's notice what is common between these ten virgins. What's common among the church? We all have a job. Our job is to honor God with how we live our life. Amen? In everything we do and everything we think and everything we say should always be pointing the glory back to him. He is the one that, we, uh, that has given us the opportunity to do what we do, to have the strength that we have, to have the opportunities that we have to honor him. And so that is our job. It's our responsibility from here on out. It is a gift. And what wonderful opportunities each of you have. You may not be serving in the church, but you are serving at your workplace, and that is a mission field that I can't get to. But you can. And it's an opportunity of a lifetime to share the wonderful things that God has done in your life. Am I asking you to go in and start thumping people on the head with your Bible? No. But what I am asking you to do is take those opportunities when they present themselves to share the truth that God has placed in your heart and the reason that you live the way that you live. That's trimming your lamp. That's making sure that it's burning bright and clear. They both had jobs. They both had lamps. They had the tools that they needed, right? They both were prepared to carry out the task. By the way, each of you has the same tool. We have the word of God, and you actually have a better tool than just that. You have, if you are a follower of God, the spirit of God living within you. The very one who will speak loud and clear and throw up those red flags in those moments where we're not quite sure if we should do that or not. And he says, don't do it. That's the greatest gift 
the wonderful tool that we have that lives inside of us to say, hey, yay or nay, do it or don't. They had their lamps. But they both fell asleep. They both get tied up in the world. Do you ever get tied up in the world and kind of forget? Sure you do. We get a little distracted here and there. That's what's happening here. They know their job. They've got, they, everything's ready. But they just get a little distracted. They get a little sleepy. We never get sleepy as Christians, right? Sure we do. They both heard the cry. Can I just pause here and say, it's coming. It's going to happen. And I know many of you are thinking, well, how do you know that for sure? I just got a hunch. (laughs) Just a gut feeling. There's been so many things that God has shared with us and shown us in Scripture that has proven him to be faithful and true. There's been many things that Jesus has done in his lifetime based on what Scripture tells us. Historical documents that validate that he was here and he did the things that he did. So when he tells me that there is a day coming where he will return to take his church home and then to come back and take over the world, I can stand confidently on that. Because I know what he does in my heart. I know what he does in my mind. And I've seen him do things in the people around me. So, yes, I can confidently say it's going to take place. It's going to happen. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Am I ready? Because I don't know when it's happening. You don't know when it's happening. And don't you dare believe anybody when they say, I know when it's happening. Because they don't. They both trimmed those lamps. They both trimmed it out. Now, unfortunately, the foolish couldn't trim it as well. They couldn't refuel uh, refuel it with the oil. But they could cut off the burnt ends. They could trim it up or down to make it burn. But only one was really prepared. Only one was prepared. Now, preparation is going to be a little different for all of us, right? Right? Some are better readers than others. Some are better prayers than others. Some can hold and lock in knowledge And understanding better than others. But we still all have a responsibility to prepare. I can't prepare like some of you can. And you can't prepare like I can. But we all can prepare. I don't want to be caught foolish. I surely don't. The preparation was the difference. Think about this. They looked most likely, potentially, at past experiences. I'm sure that the ones that were chosen to be in this wedding feast to welcome the bridegroom home, I'm sure that they had probably watched other attendants do this. Maybe there's a a seminar they had to go to to figure out what it looks like. I don't know, but I'm confident in knowing that this wasn't anything new to them. They've seen it taking place before. By the way, it's the reason why I love that we have such a nice mixture of ages in our church because I can look to those that are a little older than I and I watch their life and I see the experiences that they've been through and I can learn from them. And I want to be that for the younger generation. I want to be around people that are a lot younger than I am. One, because it makes me feel young. But two, because I got a little life experience. I got some stuff that I've gone through and things that I've dealt with that I can share with them to keep them from going through those things and allow them to be able to be prepared on the things that I've experienced. So yeah, past experiences are good. Now, does that mean they need every detail? No. But the lessons that I've learned through Christ and through his word, those are the sight line that I want to give them. Is everybody hearing me? It's not necessarily about the experiences. It's about what I've learned from the experiences. These people are thinking ahead, too. Now, am I asking you to have your five-year, 10-year, 20-year plan? Nope. Mm -mm. Nope. But I am asking you to have an eternal plan. That eternal plan starts the moment that you give your heart and life to Christ and say, I'm all in. I surrender everything to you. I'm asking you to be Lord of my life. I want to be your servant. That eternal plan begins in that moment and you stick to your guns and you continue to learn more about him in preparation for the time that he will come and take you home to be with him. And part of this is you got to be a little level-headed. 
Now, that's really hard for me. But I work really hard at it. I try to stay in my little space of what God has for me. And to not get too far out on the left or the right and be foolish in those moments. Because when I can stay level-headed and stay grounded in his word, it makes me wise and I can make better decisions. Many of us respond way too much emotionally. And I get that, man, that is so deep. It goes way back to some of our childhoods. It goes back to some of how people have treated us. And I, I get that. But please do not hide behind that. Come on. Don't hide. But don't let that define who you are because it is a part of who you are, but you are defined by being a child of God. And a part of our preparation is working through the past issues of our life to bring us to a place where we can be level-headed to where when we read scripture and see things that we really don't know or don't like we can say God help me work through this and he welcomes you in and walks you through and allows you to be in a level-headed space that you need to be that's tough for us because we get busy we don't want to trim our lamps and we don't want to think ahead I can barely pay attention to what I got going on right now right Am I the only one that does that? Okay, thank you. I feel much better now. But in order to be prepared for the eternal, I've got to pay attention to what's going on right here, right now by leveraging my past experiences and looking forward to what's coming and putting it all together through the help of the Spirit of God to where I can be the level-headed Christian that he's called me to be. Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that what we want? Do you know the only one that can give you that? It's not me. It's not Charlie. He retired. (laughs) He's enjoying it way too much. Christ, God, his spirit is the only one that can do all these things for us. The lack of preparation is what's devastating. You ever gone somewhere? Listen, one of my greatest fears and nightmares, literally, I have these nightmares, of coming to a funeral. In fact, I just had that the other night. I I went to a funeral, and I didn't have my little black book that has all my stuff in it. And I was flipping out. Do you know how nerve-wracking that is? Pastor Lasko, you know what that feels like. Like, that is scary stuff. I've had dreams where I've gotten to church, and they call me on to preach, and I knew that I was supposed to be preaching. I didn't have my Bible. I didn't have my notes. I didn't even have any pants. Like... (laughs) Those things are important. (laughs) But a lack of preparation is devastating to whatever you have going on. And if I'm not preparing for the coming of Christ, when he comes, I won't be prepared. And let me tell you, that's going to be the most devastating thing that will ever happen to you. Because it causes us to be in a last minute panic. Sometimes I live in that state, right? Everything kind of gets a little chaotic and we just panic all the time. But notice what they did. They left their job. They left the space that they had agreed to, committed to, to go do the preparation that they should have been doing all along. And when they did that, they missed out. They went elsewhere to find the knowledge, to find the wisdom, to find gain. And it caused them to be late to the party. That's not good. It's not good. Here's the problem of the foolish. They thought, what I have is enough. You ever thought that? God, you know what? What I have to offer you, you'll deal with it. What I've got, all my baggage, all my stuff just is what it is. And you know what? God is so good because he really will take us as we are. He really will welcome us in and cleanse us. But here's what he asks of us. Don't stay there. Don't stay there. And that's part of our problem is, yes, God, take me as I am, but I'm staying that way. Deal with it. And God says, oh, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it but maybe not in the way you want me to. 
So the problem with the foolish is they thought that what they had was enough. Their oil that they thought would be enough, not preparing for the fact of a delay or not even knowing when he's coming. They just said, what I learned in Sunday school is going to be enough for the rest of my life. I don't need to read the Bible anymore. Amen? That's what we're talking about here. I prayed the prayer, so I'm good. Yes, praying the prayer is vital. It's important. Being baptized is vital. It's important. That's just the beginning. This thing is a journey. It's a race. We're trying to get to the end. We want to keep moving forward. And sometimes what you think is enough may not be enough. I talk the talk. Well, I got good Bibleology, right? I got good Christianese. I can say all the right stuff. I have every Sunday school answer you could ever ask me. Good for you. I'm not sure that anywhere in Romans it talks about as long as you can talk the talk, you can go to heaven. I'm not sure anywhere in Scripture it says that, actually. I look the part. Boy, don't I look the part? I look like a Christian. Right? Got my hair almost nice and tight. I need a haircut. I at least don't have my sleeveless shirt and my ratty shorts on and my tennis shoes on today, right? I at least wore a suit, so I must be a Christian. Listen, it's not about, and and please hear this correctly. It's not about the look, but it is. It's not about the look shouldn't be about what I look like, but I should represent Christ in a way that is honoring to him in the way that I look. And that's going to be different for each person. That's between you and God. But please don't think just because you dress up and you come to church that that's enough. Because it's just not. And I got plenty of knowledge. Man, I read the scripture backwards and forwards. I know every Bible story that's in there. I've even memorized the whole book of Psalms. That would be amazing, actually. (laughs) Knowledge is so important. And honestly, knowledge is vital to our growth. But head knowledge only gets you so far. Heart knowledge of understanding what God is trying to get to our hearts and our minds through his word. That's where it's at. That's the knowledge that we should crave. But if I'm just relying on the fact that I can read scripture and understand it, and, but I'm never applying it, it's probably not going to be enough. It's not enough. And that's what we find with these foolish people. So why didn't the wise share? This is an interesting question, right? I mean, these are Christian people. They should have said, absolutely, I'm going to share my stuff with you. Well, let me help you think about some things. One, they actually did want these others to succeed. Did you notice that? Hey, we we can't give you what we have, but we go buy it. Like, you've still got time. He's not quite here yet. Go find what you need. Now, I'm sure part of them were thinking, you foolish person. You saw us being prepared and getting our all together and, and, and doing all these. Why didn't you do it? And so many times we do that with our friends and our neighbors and our unsaved coworkers. We're like, what are you doing? You see me over here living this life and you make comments all the time, but why are you not doing the same? Because it just happens that way sometimes. It's not shareable. Now, it would seem to us that the oil would be shareable. I mean, it's just oil. But you got to get past the external part of the story and see what the story is really saying. What I have isn't shareable in the sense of I can give you part of what I got. I can talk to you about what I have. I can model for you what I have. But the salvation that God has given me, I can't share that with you. For instance, many people think that because... I'm a pastor, and Sally's a pastor's wife, and my kids are pastor's kids, that they probably don't really need to pray the prayer that they're just going to be grandfathered in because I'm a pastor of a church. Now, listen, I I hear the giggles. You would be surprised at how many people really think that. And the reality is, my salvation is not your salvation. 
Your salvation is your salvation. My salvation is my salvation. It's between me and God. And it's not shareable. It won't count for you. So when we're talking about them sharing the oil, it's not that they didn't want to. It's just not possible. Listen, as bad as I wish that I could have enough faith for many of you, when you're in your spots and you're just tormented on what you're facing, I wish I could share with you and just just take a piece of my faith out and put it into you. But I can't. The only thing I can do is talk with you and listen and cry with you and encourage you and pray with you in hopes that somehow or another it bolsters up the faith and trust that you have. But my faith won't count for you. That's hard for us because some of us have some kids that are in wayward spots. And we're just hoping. But until they make the decision to follow Christ, nothing's going to be any different. And that's hard. That's not fun. My preparation is not your preparation either. Listen, I I prepare for the sermons, right? And the things that stick out to me and the things that move me may not be the same things that God works on you with. It is fascinating. And by the way, anybody's always welcome on a Monday afternoon to come and sit in our sermon prep. I mean, we, we got limited space, but you're more than welcome to come. It is fascinating to me to listen to all the conversations that are going on and the different things that jump out of each of us and how it hits each of us differently. Now, some things are kind of the same, but a lot of things are just a little different. It's wild because that's how God works. And you are going to need to prepare in different ways than I'm going to need to prepare because of our, our life backgrounds, our life experience, the things that we're experiencing right now. It's all going to be a little bit different. But the reality is you need to prepare. You do. I will give you all that I can from now until Jesus comes or as long as he leaves me here. I will give you everything I got. But it won't be enough until you choose to do your own preparation. Amen. I'll just amen that one for you because that's not what we think. That's not in growing up. We always assume, well, the pastor will do it all for me, right? If my pastor will just come talk to my neighbor, I know they'll come to church. No, you go talk to your neighbor. You know them. You already have the relationship with them. I don't. I'll be happy to talk to them, but I guarantee you, you're going to have better luck than I will. Because you've already won them over. My preparation is not your preparation. I'm going to go back to the trimming of the lamp, and then I'm almost done, I promise. Trimming of the lamp is so important in this passage for me. This, And again, there may be other things that stuck out to you. This is what really captivated my attention in a big way. Trimming my lamp is my responsibility. I had on there, trimming your lamp is your responsibility, but I wanted to make it personal for me because you can't trim my lamp. You can call me out, you can hold me accountable, you can say, hey, I noticed something. But until I go before God and say, God, what is it? And he reveals it and I say, you're right, let's cut it together. My lamp will not be trimmed. That is something I have to do. I can pray with you, I can encourage you, I can guide you. But until you fall on your face before a holy God, your lamp's not going to get trimmed. And by the way, we were talking about this in our men's meeting this past Thursday. If you missed it, you missed a good one. God can do some great stuff, but we have a responsibility in doing it with him. I can't just say, okay, God, just take away this thing that I struggle with, but then go right back to it and put myself in that position to do it. I can pray, God, help me with it, but I have to make a physical effort to not go back around to do those things. Amen? And so if my responsibility is to trim my lamp, I must go to the one who knows my lamp the best and say, what is it? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If I want to know where I'm going, I need to go to his word. That his word will reveal to me the areas in my life that need to be trimmed, cut away, refueled. I can't tell you how many times I've been exhausted mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and I go back to his word and I am refueled. That's trimming your lamp. Trimming my lamp allows my light to burn 
bright. When I cut away the dead stuff and I pull that wick up just a little bit more where all the dead stuff is gone, that light will burn much brighter. By the way, that's not just good for you. That's good for your neighbors and your coworkers that aren't believers, for the family members that haven't quite gotten it yet. We already know this. He talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. I know we keep going back to it, but he's kind of bookending his ministry with the Sermon on the Mount and now his last little parables. He says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. That's your job. God has saved you from so much stuff. He has lit your lamp, and you have now the responsibility to continue to cut away to where that light will burn so bright that it will draw men to Christ because of what he's doing in your life. That's exciting. Like, that's what this is all about. I know some of y'all are like, golly days, he's going so long, you already left me. Stay with me. Five more minutes. Come on. Give me five more minutes. Trimming my lamp allows my light to burn clean. You ever watch like a, a, a wick that's been burnt for a while and then you relight it? It comes off of that black smoke for a little bit and then it'll start burning clean again, right? Um, especially if you cut that black part off. Matthew six twenty two. again, Sermon on the Mount still. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Here's why I picked this verse. If my lamp is trimmed properly, if through scripture it has cut away the deadness of my life and has refueled me, my eye will now be able to see things the way that it's supposed to see and see them cleanly. Come on, let that sink in just a little bit. Like that's important. What I allow into my eyes, what I allow into my life through what I see has the potential to dirty my flame. And I don't want to dirty my flame. I want my flame to burn bright and clean. Therefore, I must trim my lamp, prepare my life, be infused with the wisdom of God. Therefore, I will see what I need to see clearly and cleanly. And then lastly, trimming my lamp allows my light to burn a long time. When I refuel through the scripture, when I trim off the junk, that light will burn until Christ comes. And notice in Revelation 22, 5, that is at the very last of the book. He says, there shall be no night there. We're talking about heaven. When he reestablishes his kingdom on the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no need for light anymore. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You see, we will no longer need our lamp because he will be our lamp forever and ever. This light will never go out. But it's our job to prepare it and continue to prepare it and continue to trim it and to continue to keep it clean and to continue to moving forward for him and who he is. Mm -mm -mm. Three things real quick. Make sure your lamp is trimmed. You can interpret that however you want. Is it not burning very long? Okay, let's trim it. Are you running out of fuel? Let's refuel. Is it burning a little dirty? Let's cut some junk off. Let's stop playing games, right? This is our job. It's our responsibility. It's through the gift of the Spirit that he comes in and says, hey, this is what needs to go. Please make sure you're aware. Make sure you're aware. They were sleeping. But they were aware enough that when they heard the call, they got up and got ready. You're going to be distracted in the life that we live here. You just are. But be so aware that when God prods your heart to say, hey, I need you to do this, or I need you to go here, or we need to work on this, that you are aware enough, even in your distraction, that you can say, yes, Lord. Be aware. And it's probably a good thing to be aware because he really is coming back. And we don't know when it's going to be. And encourage all to get ready. Listen, for me, Sunday mornings are are just my chance to be your biggest cheerleader. And I know sometimes my cheering for you seems a little hard and I'm coming at you, but you will never find a more passionate cheerleader for your sake than me. I want the best for each and every one of you, but I can't do it for you. 
The only thing I can do is to push you in the direction. This is on you. Because ready or not, he's coming back. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready? And the only way to be ready is you got to be wise and not foolish. As our praise team comes, let me run through some questions. Number one, when is the last time you trimmed your lamp? When is the last time you took an inventory of your oil stock, of the condition of your wick? When's the last time you've let that joker burn bright? And when's the last time you actually were barely showing any light? Only you can answer that, but God can help you. So this morning, why don't you just ask him, God, where's my lamp at? He may already be revealing that to you. He may already be telling you. But today's an opportunity for you to, to get your wick straight. I know last week we talked about towards. Today we're going with your wick. Got to let it burn clean and burn bright and burn strong. Question number two, what are you relying on for when he returns? When he comes back and we hear that trumpet sound and we hear the bridegroom cometh, what are you going to be relying on? You're going to be relying on what the world has told you is good or what our scripture has told us is good? And then lastly, real simple are you ready I mean seriously we we can ask these questions and give all the right answers but the question of the day for you is this are you really ready is your lamp trimmed is your lamp full of oil is your life ready to meet Christ because literally in the blink of an eye he could come back right now and that is a big statement and a big thought are you ready I'll be standing up here for some time. Be love to talk to you. Altars are always open to come and pray. You don't have to come and pray with me. Find somebody that you trust and go and talk with them. But seriously, don't wait. Stop playing around. Let's trim some lamps and burn bright for our community. Amen? We've got some people in our community, in your neighborhoods, and in your workplaces that need to see the light of Jesus. And maybe you're just burning a little too, too dirty. Maybe you're not burning very bright, or maybe you're just exhausted. Let me tell you about my friend Jesus. He's ready for you. And what he has to offer you, you can't find anywhere else. God, I love you, and I appreciate all that you do. You're so good and so true and so wise. Lord, may your spirit move in the hearts of your hearers today. May you be honored and glorified in the way that we respond. And may you show up in a big way and move us to a response in Jesus' name.